Our next speaker is Nicolas Silva, and he comes from the Paris office. I kind of failed of finding uh, jokes or strange things about his likes, so I will just go late. If he's French, he will probably like cheese and wine, right? No, she will, he will confirm afterwards. I invite you to listen to Nicolas Silva. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, can you guys hear me at all? Like, am I go actually going through the speakers? No. Um, all right, let's make sure that I am not on mute right now, I think. Um. Yeah, let me just give you the phone. All right, I, do I need to speak louder? Yes. All right, I will, I will try to do that. Do that but <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, I'm, I'm sorry in advance, my, my voice is very, very broken, and uh, my brain is barely in a better state. Uh, but I'll do my best um, to talk about what brand we today. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit before, before that about um, Firefox and how like the rendering engines in today's browsers work. Um, so a little bit of an architectural overview, and then I will talk about WebRender and what we're trying to do um, with this new shiny project. Um, my, my goal here is really to, um, to see if, um, to, to share some experiences and maybe um, sparks some, some interest. And if you, if you guys um, are interested in, in this topic, um, it's probably that we won't have time for a lot of questions in the end, so don't hesitate to find me after a talk and, and we should chat about these things, especially if you've been working on similar projects, because I know that there are different open source projects that try to achieve similar goals. So, so here we go. What better? <clears throat> so before I go, oh, this is I'm much louder now. Okay. Before I talk about um, today's browser, I can give a, a little introduction on, uh, on Servo, which is a project that is um, driven by the Mozilla research team, which I'm not actually part of. Um, but I, I like to work with them. They're really great, and they have this beautiful logo. Um, and it's, it's kind of telling, uh, when it comes to like how much of a product we're trying to make that, that thing. Really, Servo is mostly research, and it's really good at it. It's really great to, to try out new ideas uh, that would be very hard to, to try in Firefox, uh, because Firefox is a very big uh, code base with some amount of technical debt. And so having this research browser where we can try out new ideas and work out code and not really worry about uh, what users at all is really, really nice. And this is the reason we can have things like WebBender today. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about what web browsers do uh, today when it comes to rendering. Um, so this is a bit of a loaded slide. Um, I'm not, like, can you guys all see it? Okay, yes, okay. Um, when you're a web developer, you usually interact with the DOM. And so in, in, the, in the rendering engine, we have a representation of the DOM, which is just that, like a tree of nodes that only have like positions, um, the, the layout needs to be computed, and uh, when this layout is computed, you obtain what we call a frame tree. Um, other browsers like Chrome and WebKit, um, well, uh, Link and WebKit, uh, tend to call this the flow tree, I think, but it's, it's pretty much the same. Um, from, this, um, from this tree of positioned elements, Firefox will build what we call a display list. Um, which is a, a flat-ish list of um, what we call display items, what are, which are things that know how to render themselves. And um, the kind of display items that you can get are like image display item, border display item, uh, text, uh, things like that. And they're, it's not actually a list. It's like, so you can have like a scrollable display item that contains another display list inside of it. But it's mostly like a list. It's, it's pretty flat. And uh, so far, we, we haven't like, actually rendered anything. We've just built some implementation of the page that is uh, closer and closer to what we actually want to use to render things. <coughs> Sorry. So um, we take this display list and we render it 
in a layer tree. A layer tree, you can think of it as um, those layers in Photoshop where uh, intermediate surfaces that contain like, the actual render content. And we use that uh, as a tree in order to be able to say, OK, like, this, there's going to be this, this header there, which, which is going to stay there, and, and the contents of the page is going to just like, move underneath it um, for scrolling and transforms and such. And so this is why we have uh, a, like, this compositing infrastructure. And until this limit there, we're all in the content process. But this layer tree is not actually brought to the stream on the content process. We share it with the compositor process. And then we do what we call the compositing, which is uh, the action of um, taking all of those layers and uh, flattening them on the screen. And we, we try to do that at 60 FPS. <clears throat> uh, is, is even at 60 FPS, the way we do it is, is pretty challenging. So it's, it's very useful to be able to separate the painting from the compositing and be able to, to scroll at 60 FPS. Uh, this architecture is really, um, historically, comes from how, how CPUs um, used to work a while ago. And it's a pretty sound architecture, actually. Um, however, if we want to use the GPU, we, we can actually do things differently. Um, so this, this whole architecture that most browsers are using hasn't really been designed to take full advantage of the GPU. And um, one of the ways this manifests itself is in the way that, for instance, display lists will have display items who know how to render themselves, but they don't actually know how to optimize themselves uh, by looking at the rest of the display items, which is something that we really need to do if we want to do things efficiently on the GPU. <coughs> so, so what about the blender? The blender is sorry about this. The blender is an attempt to um, move away from this type of architecture and do something that is different. That's designed around using um, the GPU. So the, the architecture of the blender is, is kind of like a, a game rendering engine, which has um, some advantages that I'll, I'll talk about at the end of the talk if I have some time. Um, we don't actually do a distinction between the compositing and, and the painting. We just render everything on the window directly. So that would be on what we used to call the compositor process, but now we would call, I guess, the render process. I don't know, the main process. Um, so we take display items, we take a display list and we just use that as the source of information to build commands that we send to the GPU and then we send them to the GPU. Um, if, you, if you look at what we can do, or the, the, the types of things that we have to render on the web, um, a lot of them can be um, seen as like access aligned with tangles that um, are pretty easy for a GPU to sort of understand and work with. So we try to <coughs> turn all of that information into um, as much as possible, like something that the, the GPU can understand. Uh, it's using OpenGL for now. Um, whenever we get to actually ship uh, it to users in Firefox, it will probably have other backends. But right now, we're focusing on having only one so that we can still, you know, um, experiment and, and move quickly. Um, this is still very much a work in progress. Um, WebBender doesn't support all of the features that we need right now, um, so. The way we go about, for instance, integrating this into Firefox is to say, okay, we have two rendering systems, and for everything that WebBender supports, we will use WebBender. For the rest, we will still use our own rendering system and and, and, and render these things in images and then use these images in WebBender. It's written in Rust, which is sort of irrelevant to sort of the outline of this talk, but I just wanted to mention it because it's a pleasure to work with this language. I really love it. Um, and something else that is very important in the design philosophy of WebBender is that it's designed to focus on the, primi the primitives that are most common on the web. 
So um, where some APIs will try to solve the hard problems first, like drawing arbitrary shapes with anti-aliasing and like different kinds of patterns and, and things like that, like Carol or Ski I would, uh, would do. Web render doesn't even support arbitrary shapes. It can only understand things that are very common on the web, like rectangles, rounded rectangles, images, um, blurs, and, and things like that. And so um, this is really important because this is actually how we, we get most of our performance, by simplifying the problem and finding the solution that works best with this simplified problem. So how do we make things uh, using the box on the GPU? Um, one very important thing is that GPU APIs, um, especially the sort of OpenGL, D3D, Dendro 11 AI APIs, are really bad at submitting a lot of block holes. And so somewhere in our land that I mentioned, we will we'll have to be smart about not uh, sending too many of them. So batching is the keyword here. Um, GPs are very stateful things. And switching the, between states is very expensive. So for instance, if you're rendering into a surface and you want to render into another surface and then go back to rendering on the first surface, it's very expensive to switch between this, these surfaces. So your, your batching also needs to sort of take into account that um, minimizing those state changes is really important. Transferring the data to the GPU, from the CPU to the GPU and the other way around is also very expensive. So again, we we'll have to design our system around trying to avoid sending too much data. Or if we need to send a large amount of data, it should stay on the GPU if we're going to reuse it in the next frame. And one thing that is good about um, about what one is that it knows that it's going to have more frames, and so um, the API and the sort of architecture is, is designed to take into account the fact that most of your next frame is going to be like the current frame. So the resources that you are building that are expensive to build should stay on the GPU and be reused. And another thing is that memory bandwidth is really costly, especially on mobile devices, which tend to have a very, very high density pixel um, screens, sorry. Um, and so we should strive to avoid touching too many pixels, or we should strive to avoid touching the same pixels too many times. If we're going to cover that pixel, it's probably not worth drawing the thing that is underneath uh, the, the top exponents that like, actually covers it. So overdraw. And the overdraw is, is, isn't actually it's, it's a pretty hard thing to, to solve in many, um, for, for many rendering APIs. So uh, designing around that is, is also a good thing. So what, what do you have in web pages? Um, what we do are actually pretty simple when you think about it. It's a lot of rectangles, uh, rounded ones. Rectangles are actually so common that you really want to have like, a specific primitive for them. Uh, rather than like building a path that has like arcs and, and filling that. Um, I think that is actually very important. We have images, obviously. Um, we don't actually have optimizations for cat pictures, but maybe someday. Um, we have shadows, um, and we have borders and a bunch of other stuff, but generally the, the amount of primitives that you have on the web uh, um, uh, uh, it's pretty small, it's pretty small. So this is a screenshot of the uh, GitHub page uh, of the server project, or the web on the project, actually. So you can see that it's like, it's mostly the tangles, borders, uh, and text, obviously, uh, very important. <coughs> so in web render, this translates to shader primitives. We need shaders to render, uh, to, like, map to those, like, really basic primitives that you see a lot on the web. Um, so we have uh, salt color, we have images, what are the images? I'm not going to actually like show them all sort of, uh, you can do the, the slide. It's not very uh, interesting in itself, but what's, in, what's interesting is actually that it's just, it maps to the things, the primitives that you have on the web. Um, and it doesn't try to be more generic than, than those primitives. Um, Webinar at the moment doesn't 
support um, arbitrary like, SVG paths. So it's some, still something that we're working on. So if you're wondering where that would fit there, um, well, it's still an interrog interrogation mark. Um, the shaders in WebRender are somewhat, sorry. No, this, I don't know how it triggers sounds. I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, the, the, the way the shaders work in, in, uh, in WebRender is um, but uh, it, it's pretty, it's pretty much like a video game, except that in, 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 in a lot of video games, we probably put a lot of data in the vertex data, and sort of like have, have arbitrary, you know, mesh, meshes and shapes, and, and build sort of your visuals around the shape of the geometry that you send around. And in one point there, we try to work as much as possible with. Um, rectangles, and if they are axis aligned, it's even better. We could we, because it simplifies a lot of things. Um, so the, the vertex geometry that we send is actually very very simple. It's just a quad with um, like single coordinates, uh, like x and y. It's a unit quad that we send, and we use instancing to render. Um, the, the many primitives. So for instance, if we need to render, say, 100 rectangles, uh, we'll just use that quad that is on the GPU and say, yeah, that quad 100 times with, um, with instancing. And in the vertex shader, we see that there is this, this unit quad, and it's not actually positioned at all. And we have a, an instance ID, and we use this instance ID to look up the information we need in some buffers or textures. Um, the the meaty, meaty detail of like storing these is a bit like a, a bit of a moving piece, uh, but we, we tend to store things into textures so we can have um, an arbitrary amount of data, and also. Um, because of some, I think, driver bugs and, and constraints that we had uh, with uniform buffer, <coughs> sorry, buffer objects. Um, so, so, yeah, the, the, the vertex shaders, they, most of them look pretty much the same. They load the primitives, they apply the transform, they apply a clip. Um, it's actually quite important to have at least one a clip applied to um, all, uh, all primitives because we want to make sure that, for instance, no drawing primitive can go out of like, the, um, the, the rectangle of the web content. Um, so every, every primitive actually has at least a rectangle web clip, and it's applied in the, in the vertex shader in most cases, which is actually very easy because you have your vertices that you're positioning in world space, and you just need to clamp the uh, coordinates to um, the inside of that bounding rectangle that defines your clip. So it's actually pretty easy. And we apply the transform, so there's two types of transform. There's the position of the rectangle like and um, the space of its stacking context. Who knows what a stacking context is? Raise your hand. All right, so I'm using words uh, that are very, very specific to, um, to the, web, the implementation of web technology. A stacking context is sort of a frame of reference for coordinates uh, in a web page. This is a, this is a gross simplification, but this is like the terminology that we would use in uh, the web specifications to talk about layouts. So for instance, if you have something that can scroll around, there is a, a stacking context that defines that frame of reference that moves in the page. Whereas um, something that will be position fixed will have its own uh, stacking context which is going to be different from the thing that is scrolling around. Um, and so back to the vertex shader, we, so we apply the position to uh, our unit quad so that it's in the, in the reference of its stacking context and then we apply a transform that is the, the transformation of that uh, stacking context. So like if you have a, um, a transform where like, like scrolling, for instance, will be one of these transformations that will have a specific uh, transformation for. Um, and so we end up with uh, these um, vertices position in the, in the right place and you have um, some, some primitive data that we can then send to the fragment shader. And the fragment shader just 
uh, computes the color that's specific to each uh, shader. So for instance, the unit shader is just going to like load uh, fetch like data from the texture and um, and uh, the um, solid color fragment shader is just going to uh, it's just going to paint the color that's stored in the primitive. Recording is a very, very important topic. Um, so I was, I was saying that overdraw is bad, and that we should strive to avoid it, especially for you know 4K screens and and whatnot. And occlusion coding is uh, how we, we do it. So this is actually a bit of a moving piece. Um, we, we moved to using the Z buffer like less than a few months ago. Uh, we used to have a so CPU side uh, software occlusion coding uh, scheme that we that we just uh, did for using the, the Z buffer, which is actually a very simple thing, and it's extremely efficient. It's way more efficient than I thought it would be at first, actually. And so um, we use the, the Z buffer that's just like a game engine would use the Z buffer. Um, we assign a Z coordinate to our primitives. The Z coordinate is actually the, the painting order. Um, so it's a bit like the Z index, uh, but it doesn't actually t map, it needs to map to the actual Z index values. And we're going to do a first pass that is the, all of the opaque objects are going to be rendered front to back. And then all of the potentially transparent objects uh, are going to be rendered next uh, back to front. And we're going to use the Z buffer to try to avoid painting uh, pixels that have already been uh, rendered by something that is um, more thought, <laughs> if that makes any sense. <clears throat> and so this technique is, is nothing new. Uh, video games have been doing that forever, especially the 2D ones that use the GPU. Um, and we really using that technique, and the, the speed up that we got from, from using that was glorious. Um, so batching is, is also very important, I already said it, and it needs to take into account this um, order that, needs, that, that is applied to the transparent um, primitives. It also needs to take into account uh, like the avoiding state switches and, and things like that. So um, for a quick primitives, it's actually very easy because we can render them in any order. Really. We try to run, render them front to back to avoid painting pixels that are going to be covered later. But if it can save, if you can avoid breaking batches, we'll probably uh, decide to render them in a different order, like render all the sorry, that's and then all the images rather than you know front to back um, straightly. Um, for the transparent path, it's a bit trickier because you need to like you need to know uh, things that overlap. You can't really draw them in any order, and that. Uh, makes sense. I'm going to wrap up quickly. Uh, but before, before that, I'll just give an example. So this is some contrived um, hypothetical web page, and the rectangles are solid colors, and the, the shapes that are not rectangles are potentially like transparent. Like, imagine that just like the anti-aliasing is forcing us to treat them as potentially transparent objects. And so um, we have the, the say, circle primitive and the triangle primitive, which don't actually exist in web render. This is just an analogy, and I'm almost done. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit late. And so we're, we're going to start with the frontmost rectangle and then draw what's underneath it. And, and so we have drawn all the rectangles. And by doing so, like when we render this, this big yellow thing there, we're actually touching a lot less pixels than we would have if we were painting back to front. Um, and then we, we start uh, rendering the transparent things uh, sort of back to front, but actually that, that uh, primitive number two here should have been first, but since we can detect that they don't overlap, um, we, we can just batch the things so that we can first render that triangle and then render the other two in the same batch. Um, I'm just going to skip that slide because it's not as important I'm learning like so um, wrapping up, um, thanks for listening to my talk. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, uh, to tell me. I'm going to be outside uh, so that people who are interested can ask questions. Maybe I have a little bit of time for questions. One or two questions, OK. Um, well, then let's, let's go for questions then. <laughs> So does that have any consequences for rolling this out?
Um, Can you please repeat the question? I will, sorry, the question, if I understand, understood you right, is why Bundler doesn't support mobile GPUs? Is that, is that no, why is that the question? Yeah, will advanced features like ATC and that affect future mobile GPUs? So, um, the, the, so the question is uh, which mobile CPUs are supported and how do we how do we deal with those that who that we won't be uh, that we won't be able to support? So as far as WebRunner is concerned, we try to target a sort of D3D10 level uh, uh, of, of GPU API. So it's uh, GLES 3.1 maybe a little. Um, don't quote me on the exact version number there, but we, it, it means that we can support a lot of mobile GPUs. But there's always going to be crappy drivers because drivers are really hard to write and they tend to be bad. So um, there needs to be a fallback and WebRunner doesn't have a software fallback. So as far as Firefox is concerned, it's going to just use its current rendering architecture when WebRunner doesn't work. Can you please say a few words about the new font rendering engine in the WebRunner? Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, can you please say a few words about the new font rendering engine in the WebRunner? The new font? Ah, the font rendering. So font rendering is a bit of a moving piece, but right now, um, so, so yeah, I'm going to include the question. Can I say a few words about font rendering? And font rendering is a bit of a hot topic because as soon as you do your own rendering that doesn't look exactly what the uh, like what the OS provides, people go really really mad. They flip tables, they yell at you, and they fire bugs. Um, and so for each platform, we have actually a different uh, rendering, uh, font rendering mechanism. Um, so it's going to be very platform specific. We also have some people doing research about doing the font rendering directly on the GPU. Um, there's the Pathfinder project by Patrick Walton, which is uh, very promising, but it's very early, so not something that I would ship right now. <laughs> Um, lots of moving pieces. So it depends on the platform. Uh, for instance, on Linux, what we would do is use free type and have a thread pool. That was actually my slide there. We have a GIF renderer thread, which will do the GIF uh, rendering asynchronously and use a thread pool to do it and power as much as possible. And then we upload those GIFs to the GPU and we store them in the cache. And then we treat that as a it's sort of like an image, but it's not actually true. We have a, spe a special shader for this because we need to be uh, able to support separate current layers, and which means a little bit of figuring in the shader. Does that answer your question? Uh, All right, thanks very much. Um, I'm